All right, good evening. It's time for Wednesday night Bible study. We will be in Hebrews chapter 8 tonight. We are specifically going to be looking at verse 10. And so if you'll go ahead and turn over there, but I do want to tell you also to be turning to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Uh, we're going to be talking about the new covenant tonight and the blessing of the new covenant um, and why it is better than the old covenant and who is the high priest of that, which we know is Jesus Christ. But we're going to be looking at those things tonight. So I uh, hope you got your Bibles. Let's start with prayer. Father, we love you tonight. As always, thank you for loving us and blessing us with your Holy Spirit. Yes. God. Father, we ask you to illuminate our minds and our hearts tonight, Father, as your word promises you will, yes. so that we can receive that that will strengthen us, Lord, and make us better for you. We love you. Bless us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so we have been on a trek going through the book of Hebrews, uh, looking at, we spent a lot of time looking at Jesus as the high priest. He's the king high priest, and I'm not going to rehash that. But last week, we began to look at the promises that God had made in chapter 8 of Hebrews. And so um, if you got your Bible, look at Hebrew chapter 8. I'm not there. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 8, uh, beginning in uh, verse 10 is where I want us to look tonight. And this is what it says. But this is the new covenant I will make with the people of Israel on that day, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and I will write them in their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. And that's a promise. That promise actually mm -hmm. came from Jeremiah chapter 31. Uh, 31. And uh, it was a promise that God made to his people that one day there would be a different covenant, uh, a new covenant. And that covenant would not just be outside of us, but God would actually put it in us. And, uh, and so, of course, obviously during the uh, church age, we are in that new covenant age. And, um, but I, wanna, I want you to turn over and look um, at First Cor or Second Corinthians chapter 3, because that's really where we see the new covenant expressed in its best form. And uh, this is what it says, the old way. With the laws etched in stone led to death. Though it began with such glory that the people of Israel could not bear to look at Moses' face, for his face shone with the glory of God, even, through, even though the brightness was already fading away. Shouldn't we expect far greater glory under the new way? So uh, when God wrote the Ten Commandments, uh, Moses went up on the mountain um, he asked God to be able to glimpse him. God passed by so Moses could just catch a glimpse of him. And when Moses came down from that experience, he, he literally glowed. It wasn't, uh, he had to put a veil over his face, in fact, because he was glowing so much. And But the experience was one that he had there. But as soon as he began to pull away from that experience, the experience began to fade. And uh, which any of us, I, I think most of us, if we had had that kind of experience, that would be a, a, a milestone or a marker in our life that, wow, I went up and talked with God and came down from the mountain and I glowed. But salvation is kind of that day. Uh, I mean, obviously we didn't literally glow, uh, or at least I didn't on that day. Um, but when you first got saved and then when you are in Bible study, perhaps even a feeling you have in church is while you're in that moment, everything feels so real and so alive in you. But as quick as you move away from that moment, it begins to fade. And, and you forget things that you shouldn't have forgotten. Or, and, uh, and that's kind of the thought here, was that the Old Testament law was given um, in greatness. God himself wrote it, and he gave it to Moses. Moses brought it to the people. They willingly embraced it. And, uh, but, but even in Moses' encounter, it began to fade. So in verse 8, when it says, shouldn't we expect a far greater glory under the new way, now that the Holy Spirit is giving life? Mm -hmm. so, so now what God did was, instead of, um, instead of putting a battery pack outside of us, he put the power in us. Um, right. And that power is renewed by God himself. It's, it's, it, now, we can quench it, obviously. That's why the Bible says don't quench the Holy Spirit in your own life because you're, the only, you're hurting yourself and, of course, the people in your circle. But, but this power God promised to the Old Testament, none of them had it. Uh, Abraham didn't have it. Moses didn't have it. Joshua didn't have it. Caleb, 
He's literally King David didn't have it. They had the power with them, but they didn't have the power in them. And when it came to Jeremiah's day, God made this promise to a people who were terrible. That you know that wasn't all that God said in Jeremiah. In fact, God said some pretty harsh things to them in Jeremiah. But this was a promise that one day it would come where God would no longer deal with us from the outward, but he would deal with us from the inner. And he would literally, as uh, Hebrew says, he will put that covenant in our hearts and in our minds. Shouldn't we expect far glory? If the old way, which brings condemnation, was glorious, how much more glorious is the new way, which makes us right with God? This new covenant was all on God. It was a promise that God made uh, to us. It, it, this is not one of those if or kind of things. This is a this is a promise that God made, and and this promise, which of course we know is Jesus Christ, the writer of Hebrews knows the exact same thing. This promise is embodied in Jesus Christ, and so you don't get uh, you aren't ever right with God outside of your uh, relationship with Jesus Christ because outside of a relationship with Jesus Christ, there is no Holy Spirit giving you that inner power. So you can't claim the new way if you don't have the way, which is Jesus Christ. And then if you do have the way, that inner power is there. Now you can deny it or quench it and do all those things, but that inner power is there. And God knew that we are all but flesh. And, and he knew that we were weak. And so instead of just having a set of rules, God put the power within us to follow the good rules. There's nothing wrong with the Old Testament law. Not a thing wrong with it. The problem with it is us. It's always been the problem with the law is the humans. And in fact, uh, in Romans, no one has ever kept the law except for Jesus Christ. And so now what makes us right is God. It was grace. And we talked about the grace of God last week. In fact, verse 10 says, the first glory was not glorious at all compared to the overwhelming glory of the new way. So if the old way, which has been replaced, was glorious, how much more glorious is the new way? Now, you got to keep it in context. He, what is he talking about? He's talking about the forgiveness of sin and the making right, the old temple way where the priests would go in, make sacrifices for themselves, then make sacrifices for the whole nation that's the old way. He's not talking about the Old Testament law because that still is relevant. The Bible says it will never pass away because it's not wrong, but we are. And that's so the new way is the blood of Christ covers us, and that's what makes us right. We don't need a priest to do it. You don't need me to do it for you. In fact, I can't do it for you. It's something you have to do for yourself. Uh, it's much more glorious, and this new way remains forever. Since the new way gives us such confidence, we can be very bold. We are not like Moses who put a veil over his face so the people would not see the glory, even the glory, even though the glory was destined to fade away, but the people's minds were hardened. And to this day, whenever the old covenant is being read, the same veil covers their minds. He's talking about the Jewish people. And it, it isn't that God wants a veil. Some people will teach that God chose to put this penalty. He did not. But it, there is a veil there that if you do not choose Jesus Christ, you choose the veil or the hiding or the blinding or the hardening of your heart in which uh, God wants to give you. The people's minds will harden to this day when it's being read. Um, the same veil covers not just their hearts but their mind and they cannot understand the truth. It's not that they will not. It says they cannot. Why? Because they will not embrace Jesus Christ. That's what the whole argument is about. You, you embrace God in the terms that God has set for us to embrace him, and he will then enlighten your hearts and your minds. You choose to try to go a different route, and you're only fooling yourself, and the word says you. it's not that you won't. You cannot understand the truth. This veil can only be removed how? By believing in Christ. Only way it happens. And the Bible says whosoever can do that. Um, it's not a select group of people as some claim. And it's not a predestined group of people that God had ordained before the beginning of time. Why in the world go through all these motions? 
God said, whosoever believeth in me should not perish but have everlasting life. But the truth is you've got to believe. I read this week, and I'm going to preach on it on Sunday, that God gave every man a measure of faith, even the lost. Mm -hmm. Every man has the ability to believe. Not every, not every person will, but they have it within them because God put it there. Uh, it may be small, but the Bible says, Jesus said, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you could do great things. And so um, the veil can only be, yes, even today when they read Moses' writings, their hearts are covered with that veil and they do not understand. But whenever someone turns to the Lord, what happens? Mm -hmm. The veil is taken away. Then everything, why? Because you're special, because you got new eyes? No, because you got the illumination of God through his Holy Spirit in your mind and in your hearts. You, you got a good heart and a good mind. Now, you can still corrupt it. Don't Please don't see this as, whoop, all of a sudden I'm transformed, never any problems, never any worries anymore. It's not, absolutely not true. But you have the power to overcome those evil things, whereas before you could not even understand. But now you can been taken away for the lord is the spirit and wherever the spirit of the lord is there is freedom <laughs> and that one from what mm -hmm. from communism he's not mm -hmm. talking about a type of government he's talking about sin yes and and the penalty the wages the the the, the weight of sin in all of our lives and you can now be free it doesn't say you are but you can be so all of us who have had the veil removed can see and reflect, and I love that language, we not only can see, but we can reflect the glory of the Lord. I often wonder sometimes when we're sitting, especially when we're singing, I see it more, I, I guess, than any other time. I see people out there and it just seems like there's such a disconnect with the glory of the Lord because some songs, you know, I get, you know, everybody's got their own preferences about music, uh, and that's okay, but, you know, when you're singing about the Lord, there's sometimes that you know you can just it's it's almost touchable. The Spirit is so real in the room, and some of you are unaffected. And I wonder if it isn't because you still have a veil. It isn't that you don't want to be, because obviously you've arrived for some reason, but you don't have Jesus Christ. Therefore, you don't have the Spirit. And if you don't have the Spirit, you're still covered in the veil. So it is an exercise of frustration that eventually leads people out of church and away from the Lord. And God don't exist because he don't reveal himself to me. He does. But you have to receive God on his terms, not on yours. And that's, that's the hard thing to see. And the Lord, who is Spirit, makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. Now there's the crux of what we're trying to do at church is as, as you are saved, that's, that's who the church is, not the people that attend church, but the saved body of Christ has had that veil removed. And what we do is we want to give you the tools necessary so you can grow, not to look more and more like Randall, but to look more and more like Jesus. And he does that changing. The Spirit does that changing, but doesn't happen automatically. It, it takes work. It takes practice. But the starting point of that is when God said, made that promise way back in Jeremiah, that he was going to put his word, where? In our hearts and in our minds. Mm. Going to put it there. And, and um, I know my mind. So mm. what a work that Well, that's a miracle all in itself. And I always wondered, even when I was living in the world, why I was different from other people. I could hang around my friends and, you know, occasionally I'd want to talk about the Bible or or they'd do things that didn't seem to bother them in the least and I could do those same things and it'd just eat me alive and I'd have to try to drink it away or party it away. And, you know, but ultimately you have to wake up, especially if you're a child of God, you have to wake up to yourself until because the Holy Spirit loves you. He continually is pushing you back to the right way because you're hurting yourself and those around you. And I always wondered why, but it was because I had the ability to see. I had the Father that loved me. And not that he didn't love all those other people, because he did. But they had veils. I did not. Which made me worse than them. Because I knew how to see. I knew I had a good heart. I had a good mind. And yet I chose to willfully go against the things of God. They couldn't see it at all. And, and to this day, sometimes I wonder... 
how many of them are not saved because of me? Now, obviously, everybody makes their own choices. So, um, But I had four or five years with some of my best friends in life, and they were not affected for the good by me, at least not through Jesus Christ. And, and so I, I just want you as a Christian to understand that with a great gift comes great responsibility. You, it's more and more imperative that we are changed into um, his glorious image. How do we do that? We do that through faith. Well, we all have a measure of faith, but what are you doing to make your faith grow? That's the topic of Sunday morning service is what are you doing to make your faith grow? Do you even know how to grow your faith? And does the Bible speak on that at all? Well, you know, surprisingly, it does. And, uh, and we're going to look on that. But it's not a spectator sport. Christianity is, 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 or a walk with Jesus is just that. It's active. It's a walk with Jesus. It's not a sit with Jesus. It's a walk with him. If you're going to follow him, that takes activity. He doesn't always walk in the easiest places or most comfortable places. In fact, he, most of, his, many of the disciples, he rarely did. He walked in hard places and where difficult people were. Um, but he had his Father's will to do. You have, I have my Father's will to do. And one of those things is, is the Spirit wants to make us look more and more like Jesus. And that takes an increase in faith. I hope you're growing yours. Well, and it comes via obedience. Uh, so you have to have the faith uh, in order to act, in order to obey. But the more you obey, the more your faith increases. It's crazy because all I could think the whole time Randall was going through this is, first of all, is this not Sunday morning Bible study, uh, Sunday morning worship service? And then if you followed um, my teaching on Monday night, I mean, this is just new scriptures, same message. Uh, talking about uh, God's desired work uh, in us and among us. And so then I was thinking when he was talking about uh, the glory of God and its power uh, to shine through us, I was thinking about this, this is fun, that we are solar-powered. I was thinking about solar-powered lights, right? Mm. And um, and the more time we spend with the Father, just like a solar light, the more time he's, it spends with the sun, the brighter it shines, but if you remove its source of power, if you remove the sun, in our case, if we remove again the Word of God, um, you know, dwelling in the presence of the Lord, um, then we stifle or we um, snuff out that light, right? It doesn't shine, and so we should be shining um, brightly and, again, all the more with each new day because of the time we're spending um, surrendered to God, to the Spirit, allowing Him to shine through us. So, so again, wow. I mean, can you not just hear the Lord crying out to His people to shine with the light of Jesus, bring glory to Him, living away? I mean, I'm going back and forth between the Scriptures because I'm thinking, again, we're without excuse. We don't need you to, we don't, we're doing, look, we're sitting here, we're teaching, right? But you don't have to be taught. We don't need to be taught because God has made it clear to man of who he is and and so um it's not necessary for somebody to tell you who god is you know again you just have to decide will you will you believe he is who he says he is and will you obey and uh, again through that through that willingness to believe that willingness to obey you'll find an increase in faith and who knows what god will do mm. uh in you and through you and and again it's bigger than us it's so much bigger than us there's People, like Randall mentioned, that desperately need to see Christ in us. Don't miss those opportunities to impact people for the kingdom of God. All right. So looking forward to seeing you guys on Sunday. Just uh, some reminders. Uh, we are having live Bible study, and so we invite you to be a part of that. That begins at 930. Our live worship, if you want to be in the sanctuary, uh, begins at 1045. Is that right? That's correct. That's right. 1045. And, uh, and so we encourage you to be a part of both of those things. And then we are, once again, having live Bible studies on Wednesday night in the sanctuary. And uh, so that is at 6.30. And so we invite you to be a part of any of those live things. We, of course, always are going to continue. And may I encourage you to watch the Fast 15s during the week. Do your Bible study. 
um, through your, your Bible study class, Sunday school class. Uh, make sure you're keeping up, even if you're at home. If you are at home, um, I think I've mentioned this before, but I just want to remind you that you can still have the literature. Um, we will get it to you. You're welcome to stop by the office and pick it up. Miss Brenda will mail it to your home if you're more comfortable with that. Um, but we can get Bible study that we're going through as a family together to help us to reflect more and more like Jesus Christ. Um, you can get that in your home if you'll just let us know how we can get it to you or, or uh, make arrangements for everybody on the same page. We love you guys. Looking forward to seeing you in person soon. Until then, God bless you.